For 75 years, Palestinians have been facing genocide. The latest escalation of indiscriminate violence is simply an expression of a longer-lasting genocidal project. And over the last past few weeks, I've seen a barrage of genocide denial coming from all corners, even after last night's utter devastation. So I thought it might be valuable to clarify exactly how what Palestinians are facing is definitely genocide and how that should inform our solidarity. I thought this might be useful to someone to, to help clarify things. So there are broadly two major strains in understanding genocide. On the one hand, the legal or institutional definition and on the other, the sort of neo-Lemkinian view. So let's begin uh, because it's most institutionalised and most le legitimised with the legal definition. And while it's true that both strains of genocide uh, perspectives emerged from the work of Raphael Lemkin, who first coined the term genocide, he was increasingly unhappy with how his term was diluted through its institutionalisation within the bourgeois legal structures of the UN. However, even in its diluted form with the international legal view of genocide, it is quite clear that this latest bout of violence by the State of Israel is genocidal. According to the Genocide Convention, genocide is defined like this. Genocide means any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. As such, a. Killing members of the group. b. Causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. c. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. d. Imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, e. Forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. And it's important to note here, counter to many accounts which hold that genocide must have some minimum number of deaths required before it can, you know, be constituted as a genocide, the legal definition specifies the destruction of a people in whole or in part. Crass calculations on numbers are not only repulsive, uh, repulsive in their equivocations, but in this case, largely irrelevant to whether this fits with the legal definition. An important aspect of this legal definition, though, is the notion of intent. The UN's Genocide Convention fact sheet states that to constitute genocide, there must be a proven intent on the part of perpetrators to physically destroy a national, ethnical, racial or religious group. It is this special intent, or dolus specialis, that makes the crime of genocide so unique. So, according to this legal definition, acts are considered genocidal when they are intended to destroy a national or ethnic group in whole or in part. Does this apply to Israel's recent bombardment of Gaza? Well, let's take intent first of all, given the primary role placed on it by the UN's genocide fact sheet. As I was editing this, I came across what I would consider a smoking gun in the case of intent, which was a leaked policy document uh, revealing that Israeli's uh, Ministry of Intelligence uh, was intending, directly intending, to deport 2.4 million Palestinians out of occupied Gaza and into Egypt. Um, this is a clear intent to commit genocide, to remove, destroy um, the people of Gaza and uh, Palestinians. There are so, so many instances of Israeli politicians, military officials and journalists firstly justifying the bombardment of Gaza to destroy Hamas while continuing to conflate all Palestinians with Hamas, thereby justifying the intent to destroy in whole or in part Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. Here's just some examples. Israeli President Isaac Herzog has said that It's an entire nation out there that is responsible. It's not true. This rhetoric about civilians not, where, where, not aware, not involved, it's absolutely not true. He said this while justifying the bombardment of Gaza. This is very clearly indicating intent to destroy in whole or in part the Palestinians of Gaza. Benjamin Netanyahu said of the bombardment that I emphasise that this is only the beginning. This, with the knowledge of the mass civilian death caused by the bombardment already, is a clear indication of intent to target and destroy civilian populations. This is combined with the below statement which, uh, again, clearly indicates that the entire population of Gaza is less than human 
again indicating clear intent to destroy. Although this tweet was deleted, Netanyahu has since come out and said that Israel is, quote, in a battle of civilization against barbarism. Israel's defense minister has characterized bombardment of the Gaza Strip as a, quote, complete siege. <laughs> This, yet again, shows intent to commit genocidal acts, consistent with the UN's definition. And beyond high-level officials, this rhetoric has been used by a number of members of the Knesset. One politician called for a Nakba 2, referring to the mass displacement of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians in 1948. Clear intent. Yet another call to bring down buildings, bomb without distinction, stop this impotence, you have the ability, there is worldwide legitimacy, flatten Gaza without mercy. This time, there is no room for mercy. This general mood of intent to commit genocide has spread beyond politicians to journalists too. One journalist has said, if all the captives are not returned immediately, then turn the strip into a slaughterhouse. If a hair falls from their head, execute security prisoners, violate all norms on the way to victory. And another has said, Gaza has to be wiped off the face of the earth. The examples are far too numerous to actually list here, but what these quotes from journalists indicate is that the mood and intent to destroy Palestinians in whole or in part has spread outside of politics and into civil society. Frankly, I've never seen such a clear-cut case in, in any recent years showing the intent to commit genocide so clearly, which is why several genocide scholars have labelled Israel's actions and statements as having clear genocidal intent, including one Israeli Holocaust historian who described Israel's conduct as indeed a textbook case of genocide. I think that indeed what we're seeing now in Gaza is a case of genocide. Uh, we have to understand that the UN Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide from 1948 requires that we see special intent for genocide to happen. And to quote the convention, intent to destroy a group as defined as racial, ethnic, religious, or national, as such, that is collectively, not uh, just in the, uh, individuals. And this intent, as we just heard, is on full display by Israeli politicians and army officers since 7th of October. It is absolutely clear, considering the UN's legal definition of genocide, the bombardment, cutting off electricity, food, water and fuel, the targeting of hospitals and refugees who are running for their lives, and the clear signs of intent from Israeli politicians and journalists that Israel's actions in Gaza constitute a genocide by the standards of international law. But frankly, the standards of international law are not good enough. In the recent aftermath to the Israeli bombing of the Al-Ahli hospital and the ludicrous attempts by Israel to deny responsibility, so they, they previously bombed 14 other hospitals during this campaign, said they were going to bomb this one and faked recordings as evidence that they didn't. Which, you know, they bombed that hospital. There is there is no denying it uh, and to do so is, is, is an absurd denialism like we've seen from the US denying death counts recently. Lots of people are still saying things like, why would Israel even bomb a hospital? There's no reason for them to do so. And ignoring, of course, that they have bombed many hospitals previously, there is a very clear reason for Israel's bombardment of hospitals, for its bombardment of civilians and of refugees. It's not to defend itself or to kill terrorists, but it's entirely due to its colonial logic, a logic which explains why Israel is committing genocide and makes clear that this latest bombardment is not the sudden emergence of a genocide, but simply the latest violent explosion of 75 years of colonial genocide. So the legal definition of genocide emerged from and was pushed almost single-handedly by the Jewish-Polish lawyer Raphael Lemkin. Lemkin first conceptualized genocide, but became dissatisfied with its enshrinement in international law. Uh, the enshrinement of the crime of genocide became compromised, through its institutionalization within bourgeois legal frameworks because of opposition to its more radical dimensions from such actors as Britain and the US, as ever. The radical dimensions are specifically due to Lemkin's concept having an inherently colonial character. For Lemkin, genocide constitutes the destruction of the national pattern of the victim group and the imposition of the national pattern of the oppressor. 
This has obvious consistency with Patrick Wolfe's view of colonialism as having both negative and positive dimensions. Negatively, it strives for the dissolution of native societies. Positively, it erects a new colonial society on the expropriated land base. As I put it, settler colonizers come to stay. Invasion is a structure, not an event. In its positive aspect, elimination is an organizing principle of settler colonial society, rather than a one-off and superseded occurrence. Settler colonialism, which Israel is, requires the destruction of the national pattern of the colonized group and the imposition of the colonizer's national pattern. Following Lemkin, then, we can understand colonialism as always and inherently genocidal. With this in mind, it becomes pretty clear as to why the US and the UK, among others, tempered the understanding of genocide via its legal institutionalization. Neither powers would have been happy to enshrine in law their constant state of genocide against colonized peoples. Moreover, this view of genocide no longer foregrounds specific intent to destroy a population, but rather foregrounds the logic of colonialism as a more definitive factor. While colonialism, of course, as demonstrated above, often features clear intent to destroy populations, our definition of genocide and colonialism here allows us to understand why that intent exists, to steal land and consolidate the settler state. So much is made of the comparison between Israel and apartheid South Africa, but I think a more valuable comparison is between Israel and the colonization of what would become the United States and Canada. The American genocide was defined by constantly to expand and consolidate unincorporated territory. Such expansion required constant dehumanization and slaughter of indigenous groups. This, to me, is precisely what is happening in Gaza and the West Bank. Colonial expansion requiring constant dehumanization and slaughter. And this also reminds us that it's not just the latest round of horrendous violence which is genocidal, but that Palestinians have been resisting genocide for 75 years. 75 years of land theft, of expulsion, of death and destruction of Palestinian national patterns. 75 years of genocide. And this view of genocide also allows us to understand why calls from liberals to uphold a two-state solution between Palestine and Israel is entirely inadequate. Not only is such a solution politically and logistically impossible, but it maintains Israeli occupation over a massive amount of Palestinian land and maintains the genocidal conditions imposed upon Palestinians within occupied territories. As we know, Israel operates a racial apartheid system whereby Palestinians living within the occupied lands are subject to massive racial discrimination. But more than this, they are necessarily subject to the systems of colonial genocide. Histories are erased, even down to Palestinian street names being renamed with Israeli names. National patterns are destroyed and replaced with the colonizers. Those Palestinians which do manage to gain any legitimacy within the Israeli state only do so through upholding the terms of the settler state, fitting into the settler national pattern and maintaining the state's legitimacy as it commits genocide. This is not unique to Israel, but is present across essentially all settler colonies. And Glenn Coulthard in Red Skin White Masks traces how the liberal politics of indigenous recognition in Canada serves only to force indigenous people into settler colonial modes of being and maintain access to land for extractivist capitalist development. They do this by both creating a false distance from a previous colonialism, which apparently no longer exists, and by framing and subordinating indigenous self-determination to the edicts of the settler state. The national pattern of the colonizer is imposed just like in occupied Palestine. And just like in Canada, Israel tries to use the presence of assimilated Palestinians as evidence of the progressive nature of the state. And just like Canada, it masks its genocidal nature. So, from both a strict legal definition in which intent is the definitive feature of genocide, and from a more complete understanding of the inherently colonial logic of the settler colony, we can see that very clearly Israel is conducting a genocide. Israel is destroying Gaza, murdering civilians, attacking hospitals, because it wants to destroy any semblance of the national pattern of the colonized people, wants their land, and wants to consolidate its power. It's committing genocide because they have to. It's essential to the state's logic to do so, and there is no way to stop it except the liberation of the whole of Palestine from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea. Palestine will be free. And to add a, a last word on what solidarity means in light of this. 
I've just returned from uh, a Palestinian solidarity protest in which 500,000 people took to the streets. More of this, but we also need to be making sure other forms of resistance exist. We need trade unions to be blockading the the construction of arms. We need to be stopping our governments from producing the arms which are destroying pa Palestinian lives. Because this is not just a Palestinian issue that has no connection to us. The UK, the US, the Western world is entirely complicit. And we have a, a role then to find ways to stop it. Um, whether that is being involved in these mass demonstrations or being involved in more activist work, shutting down factories, or being part of your trade union and trying to get people to abandon working in factories, putting pressure on arms manufacturers. There was a trade union block that demonstrated the production of arms uh, for Israel just the other day. These are forms of solidarity that are needed. Um, we need a ceasefire immediately and we need to keep calling for them and keep taking to the streets to call for a ceasefire because every day there isn't one, more Palestinians die. But the ceasefire is the beginning and not the end of solidarity. Uh, and I, yeah, I don't know how useful this is, but I hope it clarifies some things for some people and I hope it's a useful resource that you can send to people who are on the fence about what's going on. Um, yeah, and that's all I have to say on that. Solidarity and from the river to the sea. So I have nothing to uh, promote after this. I just wanted to share some uh, some sites and some journalists that I think are useful to follow uh, who will all be linked in the description. So first of all, uh, Palestinian Youth Movement, Institute for Palestine Studies, Decolonize Palestine, Eye on Palestine and Resistance News Network are all good resources for you can find lots of information. And the journalist uh, poet um, Mohammed El Kurd uh, is also a good account to follow. Again, uh, I'll be linked in the description. And Yara Eid has also been uh, very good. Um, there's no, there's no way to get to all of the amazing Palestinian voices who have been constantly speaking up and screaming to the world to listen to them. But these are just a few who might be helpful for for you. Uh, I am going to read out the names of the $10 patrons I have because I owe it to them. It's a, a duty I have that I will not relinquish on. So a wee change of, quick change of tone here while I read these names of, of the people who are uh, I'm very lucky to support me. Demo Squid, Dying of Thirst, Soval Hayes, Bonnie, Kate Marshall, Nina G Public Relations, FD Signifier, Lizzie G, Quint Wolf, Kim Crawley, Anita Anispe, Ellis Wren, Sophie, Hey Joe, Cameron Blakemore, Muslim, Dash, Layum, Xander Corvus, Fia Westfall, Christopher Poth, Morgussi, Daniel Cousid, Joshua Moldenhauer, Tom Price, Kate Soiree, Esoteric Fictionalism, Shingo, Austin Talman, Robin, Rachel Mixon, Michelle H, Rich, Niels Avalgard, Tinfoil Pancakes, Kieran Gore, Aga Ghost, Barney Carroll, Joel, Daniel Hughes, Nelly Zacheva, J. Fraser Cartwright, Aaron, Tamish Kispita, and Paul Singleton. And with that, uh, I will leave. <laughs>